I just want to give you an overview of kind of what we hope to accomplish here. Um, so the, my goal in the talk is to argue for contextualization of language as a cognitive and socially negotiated phenomenon. Um, and um, the way, the means of, of, a, of achieving our goal here would be first to just outline assumptions underlying cognitive and social approaches to language development. Um, and maybe identify blind spots in uh, their thinking and describe consequences for pedagogical practice. And then um, uh, I'll get to a classroom study on the coherence of grammar integration in communicative tasks. And um, then talk about some implications for theory and practice. So it's, I'm really a, a classroom researcher um, and I usually work in the context of uh, Spanish as a second language. So we'll look at some, some data there and I have uh, subtitles and um, uh, glosses for, for you in English for those who don't know Spanish. So um, the context for this talk and our work as language teachers um, is, uh, the, the point of departure is uh, how it seems like we're talking about, when we talk about what good language teaching is uh, in uh, different contexts, it often has, it, it we're often doesn't seem like we're on the same page. So. Um, I don't know how much of this you can relate to in Australia, but um, like when you have elementary second language teaching or university second language teaching or researchers and theorists talking about second language teaching, um, we, it seems like we're talking about different things. So um, this was, uh, this picture on the left here is a picture that came from an, uh, an article in the Baltimore Sun um, newspaper. And um, I don't know if you see this in maybe your local news or national news here, but whenever people are doing something innovative in um, a classroom, especially a, an elementary school classroom, reporters go in and they have these sort of traditional ideas about what you know, good language teaching consists of. So they you know, say, oh, look, they're teaching Spanish to these kids in the elementary school. And they show the teacher like doing this thing and everybody sort of repeating aloud and doing the cheer and not really saying anything that looks like a conversation, but you know, they're, they're repeating in Spanish and like, look, this is an innovative thing. And you know, as a language teacher and applied linguist, I'm thinking, well, it looks like something you might've seen in 1940 or 1950, but, um, or we might've recommended at that time, but um, it's not like, this is still the, the kind of, uh, what's it called, conventional wisdom. So it says in this article, like Tyler Harrington, 10 years old, Said, uh, said he is happy to learn the language because some of his friends speak Spanish. So he repeated Spanish words into the headset as he worked at the computer last week with the Spanish lessons. Good Spanish teaching in the elementary school. Um, this picture on the right is from, just stolen from the University of Minnesota um, Department of Modern Languages uh, webpage. And they describe uh, their language teaching um, uh, saying that students develop a strong ability to think, write, and communicate in another language through diverse course offerings, service learning, experience, and study abroad. Um, not highlighting the speaking into the microphone and repeating <laughs> um, like they did in the Baltimore Sun. And then meanwhile, this is a picture, I don't know if you, any of you recognize it, that is Michael Long, who's one of our great uh, senior figures in the field who has talked about task-based language learning. And he describes um, ideal language teaching uh, by saying that tasks are the real world communicative uses to which learners will put the L2 beyond the classroom. Um, the things they will do in and through the L2 and the task syllabus stands alone, not as one strand of a hybrid of some kind. So um, if you're a language teacher and you're trying to figure out, well, so what is good language teaching look like? You can get a lot of disparate information that is leading you in all kinds of different directions. Um, so I would, I, I think an important place to uh, start in thinking about language uh, teaching is that it is both a social and a cognitive context for, for learning, that both, you know, we need kind of an understanding of both things to understand what, uh, you know, what we need to be doing as language teachers. Um, so I kind of drawn this little diagram with concentric circles um, and kind of in the middle is maybe the narrowest scope of inquiry, learner psycholinguistic processes when you deal with a classroom. Um, you know, you have a bunch of individuals with 
uh, meaning making and interpretation and then activity and decisions over actions being all taking place in this space between our ears, right? Um, and a lot of um, second language researchers are focused on that phenomenon and really want to kind of exclude the other things that you see in this diagram for the sake of you know, convenience of we've got something really complex going on and, and we don't, you know, we can't really take all of that on board. So we'll try to control for context. Um, but the learner psycholinguistic processes engage with classroom tasks and interaction um, that the teacher designs and tries to implement. And those classroom tasks and interaction in turn are informed by broader socially determined participant roles and expectations. And those may be uh, shaped by sociocultural norms of what good language teaching looks like. Um, whether, you know, you, how much would you teach in the second language? When would you use the first language? Um, should you be infusing content into your, you know, into your language teaching? Um, or just talking about what you do on the weekend? Um, those kind of things shape the participant roles and expectations which shape classroom tasks and interaction which then influence um, how psycholinguistic processes are engaged. So, um, as teachers are trying to uh, determine how instruction shapes development, um, uh, one way we could um, sort of think about what's going on is um, what Anthony and Richards and Rogers have stated is that um, we answer this question, however we answer this question kind of depends on your beliefs about the nature of language and the nature of language learning. Um, and I would like to kind of point out that I think whatever a teacher does reflects underlying assumptions about that, even if a teacher is not explicitly aware of them. Um, so even when you just sort of get up in front of a class and start, you know, ad-libbing what to do as a totally new teacher, somehow whatever you're doing is, is implementing a, a, an underlying belief about language as the object of instruction and language learning as the thing that you're trying to accomplish, um, the process that you're trying to engage. Um, so within the field of applied linguistics and second language uh, development, there's kind of two main branches of, um, of inquiry. Um, there are cognitive theories that um, kind of view learner language as externalized from cognitive processes. So kind of as we see, whoops, we see there, so we're kind of in dealing with the middle circle there, right? And then the um, social theories view language learning as internalized from community, community practices. So kind of seeing those outer rings of that circle being the source of knowledge that then becomes internalized through, through practice. So um, before we kind of look at my study, let's just think about, uh, kind of go in greater detail as to what some of these constructs are and how these two different views of language learning um, differ from each other. So um, this is my little uh, sketch here, um, made with clip art and Microsoft Word objects <laughs> and big data, I said it, okay. <laughs> Um, and that is a 21st century language learner right there, just so you know, okay, it was not from the 20th century. Um, the, um, as we're kind of exposed to L2 input, um, there's a, a model of our brains being sort of like computers. You have data coming in, right? And that seems to build two different kinds of knowledge, declarative knowledge about things, things that you can, con it's like a knowledge of of the way things are that you can consciously access and analyze. Um, and then implicit procedural knowledge of how to do things. And it's implicit in the sense that you don't, you're not aware of all the mechanisms that carry it out. You, what you're aware of consciously is that you're going to try to do something, but the whole, all the motor and uh, uh, processing uh, mechanisms are not, you're not consciously uh, manipulating them. You kind of set, you say do this and then the thing happens and you don't necessarily get in and, and micromanage it. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, a, an analogy to, 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 to speaking a, a language with a mixture of declarative knowledge and implicit knowledge would be just getting up and moving somewhere. You kind of think consciously, um, uh, there's the bathroom, I gotta go, I'm just gonna go. And you're not like, your command and your, your legs and everything enact that, but you're not consciously aware of every, you know, twitching and movement and contraction of your muscles that gets you there. 
And in the same sense with language speaking, when you're really proficient in a language, you say, you know, oh, there's somebody I don't know, declarative knowledge, I'm going to greet them. And I think the greeting is this, and then out comes the plan, and you're not necessarily manipulating or consciously aware of how all the muscles and, you know, uh, syntax processing is taking place. Um, so, within a cognitive theory, though, um, uh, the, the current view is that um, working memory um, is kind of this workspace that, um, as you begin to process, uh, um, incoming information uh, from your sensory uh, perception. Um, your, our, our, our minds in working memory are constantly trying to interpret and make sense of what we're doing and draw on the most relevant uh, declarative and procedural knowledge we can for that task. So you're constantly kind of, as you see things and hear things, you're trying to make sense of what does it mean. And as you try to do that, the most sort of uh, kind of winner-take-all mechanism is taking place of like how do I understand what's going on here relevant background experience relevant declarative knowledge and relevant procedural knowledge come to the fore and then we kind of figure out a plan of action and uh, what to do so you pay attention to certain aspects of the input and based on that attention um, into working memory come you know what what seem to be the most relevant uh, um, pieces of, of, of uh, background knowledge to for the task of interpretation and activity so um, I'm going to not spend a whole lot of time on here, but the cognitive view of language is basically that we have these different compartments that specialize in um, the different uh, kinds of knowledge we need to, to, for communication. And the only thing, without getting too much into the weeds of what the details are here, I just want to show, point out that I've got my pointer here. I can point with my pointer that this knowledge of what's going on, what is being said, what do I need to do in this situation is meant to be a completely separate module and completely separate um, area of knowledge from the actual knowledge of how to string words together and uh, form a well-formed sentence. Um, so there's not supposed to be a lot of direct communication between conscious awareness of what's going on and actual, you know, the summoning of grammatical structures to at the service over here. Um, so it's very sort of particularized and deconstructed and Michael can sort of second this or <laughs> when we're done here um, add some p p possible commentary. <laughs> All right, but what's kind of important is the compartmentalization and that's really different from social views of learning and um, language where it's kind of much more integrated because the, it, because the emphasis is not so much on sort of deconstructing what's going on in an individual's head. The emphasis is much more like observing what people actually do, regardless of how you might want to deconstruct what's going on within the individual. So here, this model shows, um, you know, that all the action is taking place between people. Um, we have, um, agency is the concept of how someone acts independently on their own behalf based on how they interpret what's going on in the world um, and um, how the person acts is then being interpreted in this sort of joint space called intersubjectivity between people and then depending on how you interpret what somebody is doing you could find it to be a resource or opportunity for your own action. So that's called affordances in the lingo of socio, uh, social approaches to communication and learning. So it, it's all kind of really contingent on how you perceive the world and how you see the opportunities for acting in the world. Um, so much more externally focused than internally and deconstructing you know, what's going on internally. Um, so, uh, you know, so the idea is that someone decides through their free will to um, act either as a collaborator or a resistor to what they perceive to be going on here. So suppose a teacher, you know, a teacher decides, um, you know, th their role is to help a student achieve accuracy. 
okay? So that is, as an agent, they're looking to see what the student is doing and how they perceive the student's performance and then trying to decide, okay, where do they need help based on this space here? So the student is acting to, say, give an answer in a class, in a language class, um, and the teacher is trying to interpret what's going on and then decide how to correct. So the student's activity, their agentive activity in the space of trying to, say, do a task, becomes interpreted here and becomes an affordance to the teacher who can then say, oh, I see this is where they need help, so I'm going to act in this way to help them. Um, and then it's kind of this cycle of, you know, the teacher then does something to help the student, the student has to sort of interpret what's going on and see that as a possible affordance or opportunity for their goal, which may be improving their second language. Okay, but because people are independent and have their own free will, the student may or may not inter decide to collaborate with this project of working on their language. They could say, oh yeah, I really do understand that the teacher's trying to work on my accuracy, but you know, I just got a text from my, you know, my buddy and we're going out tonight so um, I don't really care about that so um, you know so it's really this sort of negotiation of what the purpose of the interaction is about that you see there represented um, okay so the social this is a uh, systemic functional linguistics is much more well known here in Australia than it is in the US so Probably some of you may be very familiar with that. I think the main point to see here in comparison with the Chomskyan modular view of language is that it's all meant to be parts of a whole. Um, and so your, um, the, the, the expression, the, the sounds that you choose to get, that you choose as a form of expression um, are sort of mapped onto content, um, which is your vocabulary, grammar, the meanings of that, which then takes on meaning within a context of situation and a context of culture. Okay, so, um, so language system is inherently about purposeful activity um, and it uh, provides a user with potential for meaning making. Um, so all these things are interrelated within the social approach. Um, so my question then though, when trying to look at um, what language teachers could need and how to help language teachers is whether these theoretical specializations um, lead perhaps to instructional r irrelevance um, because um, it seems that theoretical resources often fail to provide details on the relationship between L2 communicative development and instructional practices. So if this is your model, do you really know as a teacher what to do about it? If this is your model, does that, what does that mean for you? And the same there and there. So um, I've experienced this in my own career and I think it's kind of a really an international problem to varying degrees that there's a disconnect like I showed with that Grand Canyon between teachers and researchers between K through 12 or primary and secondary and post-secondary um, and what we talk about is good language teaching. Um, so often answers to teachers basic questions about how when and why instruction should overtly deal with the structural building blocks of language within communicative priori priorities are elusive. So you have this little thing where a complexity of phenomenon plus a high degree of abstraction plus a narrowness of perspective in research leads to few concrete pedagogical implications. So going back to my little circles diagram, which I swear I came up with this before I saw Halliday and Matthewson's little concentric circles. I was like, hey, I'm gonna make some concentric circles. I did this a few years ago. And then I got Halliday and Matthewson like, hey, they've got concentric circles too. Oh, I'm gonna keep using my diagram. Okay, so I'm not copying. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, teachers are trying to decide about classroom tasks and interaction, and then they have these sources of information as they try to consult from theorists and researchers, and it's this you know, kind of confusing line to, well, how do I actually do this, and how do, what does this actually make sense for me in my classroom? So um, I think from, uh, um, but I, I think that as a, a, a researcher and theorist, theorist in second language learning, that leadership entails responsibility. Um, 
because novice and experienced teachers alike turn to L2 theory and research to improve their professional practice. So, um, kind of, and then, you know, when you try to distill theoretical viewpoints and research results into concrete things to tell teachers, this is often what you get. From a cognitive theoretical perspective, um, you should speak comprehensively in the L2, right? You should provide feedback and grammar explanations. Um, you should be sure that learners speak meaningfully and all will be well. So focus on communication, focus on form, but just a little bit, not as an end in itself, right? And speak comprehensively in the L2. From a social perspective, um, it's often provide ample models for learners to emulate, right? The resources are out in the social world of interaction. Teach grammar as real communication and provide targeted help with speaking, mediation within a zone of proximal development. Some of you may have heard that if you know Vygotsky in theory and everything will be fine. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is look at this video and tell me whether you think it might check the boxes of all of those criteria and then we'll see if we still need some more work. <laughs> so um, here's my video. Let me, I gotta, don't wanna start it right at the <coughs> beginning. There it is. Oh, the numbers are, I'm getting old, and the, 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 the numbers on my video card, are, are on the video thing, it's supposed to be at 37.51. Oh, that says 29. Here we go. Okay, I think this is where I wanted to start it. Okay. The woman says, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The man says, good morning, madam. Good morning, madam. Okay. Good morning, madam. Would you like to have the cleanest house in town? Comprehensible input. Yes, of course I would. Yes, yes of course I would. Modeling. Then you need the amazing, then madam, you need the amazing Hoover vacuum cleaner. Yes, you need the amazing Hoover vacuum cleaner. Meaningful input and output. What? Why not? 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 Why not? Okay, use the gesture, see? What? What? Why not? What? Why not? Why not? Try, try it with your hands. Use your hands. Why not? Why not? Why not? Yeah. What? Why not? In your what? shoulders. Say my shoulders. Why not? Why not? Why not? Yeah. Why not? Okay, everybody. There you go. So, in meaningful feedback. But, okay, I should... We should clarify, these are learners from the 20th century. <laughs> so, obviously you wouldn't do that anymore. Okay. So, um, so, I think it meets these criteria, and so that's kind of a problem. <laughs> because something is not happening here. And if I were to, you know, work with a language teacher's class, if maybe this were more interactive, too. Um, I've got to keep moving so we don't run out of time, but... Um, it's the theory of language that's more the problem than anything else because the theory of language is only about structure so um, And the theory of learning does not involve creative use of language. So that's what's kind of missing from our, our checklist um, here um, yeah. So, yeah, we're done <laughs> No more amazing Hoover vacuum cleaner um, Okay, so um, All right, I'm gonna skip ahead. So I want to um, talk about, so how do we make um, L2 accuracy relevant within communication? Because that is, I think, the, the fundamental problem that a lot of teachers are trying to face, especially at beginning levels. How do you get them to, to, how do you get learners to actually do something meaningful in a second language when they don't have a lot of linguistic resources to begin with? How do you focus on form? How do you, um, you know, ensure accuracy? And teachers are really afraid to give learners more agency in their, cons in their you know, use of the L2 when they don't have that much to work with to begin with, that it's going to become this free-for-all. And I remember, I'll just, I'll try to keep the asides to a minimum here in the interest of time, but I remember like working with um, a teacher who was trying to do more communicative activities by having learners like complete a story, right? It was an Irish Gaelic teacher and they were kind of using really like old-fashioned tr grammar translation kind of stuff. So I was trying to, I was a supervisor and I was trying to tell them you should try to do something more open-ended. So we had them read a story and then they could finish the ending. 
but the learners didn't have enough linguistic resources to do that. So then you get all these sort of questions like, okay, so how do you say kidnapped by space aliens? How do you say um, fell down the stairs and had to go to the hospital? You know, and then, so when there's not enough support for open-ended language use, then you get these, you know, the teach you get that kind of stuff and then teachers say, oh no, I can't go back to that, all right? So anyway, let's, so we're gonna look at this, we're moving into the part that's showing you an actual study. Um, and these are just some ideas based on research that um, could inform what the, the answer to this question. So how do we make L2 accuracy relevant within um, communication. So some ideas are to avoid te um, teacher-led grammar explanations, do communicative group work, um, ask open-ended rather than display questions, um, use unobtrusive recasted feedback, um, make target structures essential to communication through focused tasks, um, get learners to discuss the uh, use of target structures overtly through consciousness raising tasks, have learners talk through with languaging. We have a lot of different proposals for how to address language structure within a communicative approach.